Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we have everybody uh, gathered here. We can start in a, in a good way. Um, uh, I, um, as, as I said before, um, please find the icon, uh, the interpretation icon, the bottom of your screen and choose either um, English or, or, or Portuguese. Um, I'd like to um, begin uh, this gathering um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, before I begin the land acknowledgement, uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge um, the 215 children, this news of the 250 ch children who are found at the residential school or the former residential school in, in Camlet Loops. And I'd like to begin uh, by honoring them, by mourning them and calling for justice for those 250 children uh, and all the other children um, at residential schools in Canada who never went home uh, and who are buried on, on this land. Um, as an organization um, that employs Indigenous staff, uh, Kairos has staff who are directly connected uh, to this history and some to this, this school, this residential school, whose parents were taken and attended that school. Um, so as the country mourns the lives lost and their spirits honored, we stand in solidarity and we will continue to support and invest Canadians knowing and facing the hard truth of our history. And we acknowledge the intergenerational trauma that is faced by our own staff during this time of mourning. Now, um, if you'll join me in a, in a land acknowledgement, acknowledgement. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn on these territories. To the original caretakers of the land on which we stand, uh, I acknowledge um, the land in which I, I'm on right now. Uh, it's uh, the historical territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Petun, the Seneca, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississauga of the Credit Indigenous Peoples. To all, that, uh, to all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For all those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we hear them, the Cree Nation, the Métis, the Dene, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota, the Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Innu, and all the nations that came before us and those yet to come. An infinity of footsteps of those who long, uh, who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaties to come alive. We affirm, affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the Indigenous nations and the ancestors of this land. Once again, I acknowledge the land here, the land governed by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt uh, Covenant. Once again, I acknowledge it. This is where I am. And um, I'd, like, I'd like you to acknowledge wherever you are, the land and the original people and the history of that land. So um, greetings, everybody. Um, before we start, maybe a bit of um, a Zoom etiquette. Um, please keep your, uh, your um, microphone muted when you're not speaking. Uh, be mindful that your cameras are on. Um, please post any questions that you have during the session in, in the chat. And um, be, be respectful of, of everyone. Uh, this event is being uh, recorded in English and Portuguese, and the recordings will be available in a few days. Um, hi, um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Rachel Warden, and I am um, Partnership Manager at, at Kairos. 
And it is a great honor uh, to be here today to, um, to launch, to this, for this important event, to launch uh, the Brazilian phase of the Mayor Hub. The Mayor Hub is Kairos's living digital hub on the gendered impacts of resource extraction. Mayor Hub stands for Mother Earth and Resource Extraction, Women Defending Land and Water. And it was um, a call, it was initiated uh, by women land defenders um, themselves in November uh, 2019. The Mayor Hub uh, contains a wide range of materials on women, uh, and land defense and water defense, um, and, uh, and uh, the, the impacts of, of resource extraction on women and the, the lives of, of, of those who are, are protecting um, that land and water. I, I, I encourage you to check it out. Um, the materials include background information on the intersection between gender uh, and, and extractivism, literature, maps, maps, lots of maps uh, of conflict, of concessions and projects, guides on the defense of land and water, um, resources on corporate accountability, documentaries, videos, and everything in between. Um, the Mayor Hub has been developed in phases and is available in three languages now. Um, the first phase focused on Latin America and is in Spanish. Uh, the second phase uh, focused on Canada and that was launched in last year uh, in June. And we are here today to celebrate the third phase uh, in Portuguese. Uh, Focus with a focus on Brazil. And uh, you're gonna hear much more about this, that in the next hour. The history of this mayor hub really begins with, uh, with Fabricio Tello, who you'll meet shortly. He is the a volunteer extraordinaire who, um, who translated uh, much of the material on the mayor hub into Portuguese. As you may already be uh, aware, uh, but you'll learn much more about today. Brazil is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a land defender. If you're not harassed or attacked, you're criminalized and you're gonna hear more and personal stories about that today. Uh, the COVID-19 response is one of the worst in the world in Brazil. And this uh, confirms uh, the government's disregard for human rights and, in, and the environment. And in terms of resource extraction, there have been three tailing dam breaches with ties to Canadian extractive set, uh, with ties to the Canadian extractive sector. The most recent of which was this past March in the Amazon region of, of, of the Brazilian state of Maranhão. No less concerning, the Brazilian government is hoping to open uh, indigenous lands to mining uh, with, a, with a new proposed bill, uh, 191-2020. And this past weekend, thousands Brazilians took to the street to protest their government, uh, their government's COVID-19 response. Sonia and Maria Julia, who you'll hear from shortly, will talk more about this, this context. I'd also like to um, acknowledge uh, that as we speak in Colombia, there our partners and, 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 and people throughout Colombia are gathered in public spaces for a national feminist vigil. Uh, Kairos supports this vigil and the people's rights to nonviolent public assembly across the Americas, in Brazil and in Colombia. Now, it is uh, with great uh, pleasure that I get to um, introduce Fabricio Tello, who is really the instigator of this uh, Portuguese uh, Brazil Mayor Hub. Fabricio Tello is a newcomer to Vancouver from Brazil, where he completed his PhD in social science from the Federal University, a Rural University of Rio de Janeiro, investigating, investigating land disputes and violence in royal, rural areas. Previously, he served as a researcher on a project for the Rio de Janeiro Truth, uh, State Truth Commission entitled Conflicts and Repression in the Countryside in Rio de Janeiro, where he investigated human rights abuses uh, suffered by rural workers during the Brazilian military dictatorship. Fabricio has worked in partnership with several rural uh, movements in, in Brazil, including the movement of people affected by dams and small farm and the small farmers movement. In addition to volunteer being a volunteer extraordinaire at Kairos, 
He is currently conducting research on uh, literacy in rural Brazil as a, as a consultant with the Inter-American Institute on Cooperation of, for Agriculture. So Fabricio will be your moderator today uh, in today's discussion with uh, Sonia and Maria Julia in Portuguese. Then uh, Devon Holterman um, will give a brief presentation from the Canadian uh, Network on Corporate Accountability's new ca campaign, which was launched, uh, launched today. Uh, a short uh, question and answer uh, period will follow thereafter. So please, as I said, please keep your, um, please, please um, write your questions in the chat. Um, but that's enough for me. I want to welcome uh, Fabricio. Bienvenido, Padre Fabricio. Muito obrigado, Rachel. Uh, eu gostaria de... Uh, Thank you, Rachel. I'd like to say that I'm currently living in the territory of the people Coastal, the territory of others and other indigenous peoples, which is known as Vancouver. It's a pleasure to be here in this debate with Maria and Jada Zeno and Sonia, which are important leadership personalities Fighting for living water. I'd also like to thank Carlos, especially for the opportunity to be, to be a volunteer here and strengthening the fight between these important organizations. This is an event that's treating a very important thing. Yeah, very important event called by mining. The first is mine that we had in the violence against the Yanomani people that we had as well, that Sonia is talking about. And the, uh, and the problems that we had we had a fire in the state of Pará so we're going to have five minutes of introduction of Sonia and And at the end, we're going to have questions of the public. Maria Julia, can you tell us a bit about the movement for currently Maria Julia is part of the national Oh, she has a master's in anthropology from the Federal University. She's been working as an activist for multiple years in Brazil. First, I'd like to thank Kairos for this invitation, and especially Fabricio. He's the one that brought me in. I'd like to thank Kairos for this effort, for translating all this material. This is what's going to connect us so we can share our experiences even though we speak different languages. So first, I'd like to thank Sonia and tell her I'm very happy when I found out she was going to be part of this activity. I've been following Sonia for many years now 
And I'd like to tell her that she's a great, she's a great model to everyone. And I'd like to say that I'm very sorry for all the persecution that you're having to go through right now and all women that are trying to fight mining. And I'd like to say that, as Rachel said at first, going through a very different time in Brazil. Things that are happening are not news. Brazil has always been a very, uh, a country that's marked by inequality. We've always been exploited, especially our natural resources. And I'd like to name every indigenous people that's been going through this. Ever since our president Bolsonaro has been elected, things have um, become even worse. So what we're going through is an intensification, an acceleration of structural problems in Brazil, and they've been becoming worse. So it's not been easy to go through the pandemic in the midst of this government. We have a lot of people from MST, which is the movement for uh, landless workers in Brazil were contaminated with COVID and they're at the hospital. So we've been going through a lot. The attacks on indigenous people, the increase on exploitation of natural resources and the, and the attempt to make environmental legislation even more flexible. We've had an increase in poverty and social inequality and there's also the increase in mining in Brazil. Last year, we had a massive increase in licensing for mining projects, for new projects and for existing projects. And this becomes a massive boom in in illegal mining in the Amazon. This is a no problem, but now it's being even incentivated. And in the state of Minas Gerais, we have a lot of things going on. We have a lot of projects that are starting And we have Zoom meetings to approve projects. We have one hour Zoom meetings and then projects are approved. And this has been in getting even worse in Brazil. So we're trying to follow up on conflicts regarding mining in Brazil. Thank you very much, Maju. I will now invite Sonia to introduce herself. Sonia is the executive secretary for APIB, which is the articulation of Brazil's indigenous people. She's also, a she has a degree in special education from the Federal University of Maranhão, where she was born. She's also a teacher and she initiated her activism in the articulation of Maranhão State Indigenous People, which then led her to get her current position as executive coordinator at the articulation of Brazil's Indigenous Peoples, APIB. And Sonia has been recently facing political persecution for her leadership repending, defending indigenous rights from the federal government. So thank you, Sonia, for being here today. I know this is your third webinar today. You had one in the morning and a second one in the afternoon, and now you're here with us. So thank you very much for your effort. If you could also tell us about the impact of the pandemic on the indigenous people, it would be great. I'll now give you the floor. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. 
Thank you very much for inviting me. I'd also like to thank you for being here tonight. I'd like to thank Maria Julia for what she said, which was very informative, very strong. This is a difficult moment we're going through. We're having to surpass a few barriers that are very harsh and very dangerous. There's a pandemic amidst everything that's making everything that we were going through even worse. So right now, the scenario for indigenous people and all the peoples that are in these territories which are exploited are, is a very difficult scenario. We're suffering attacks and invasions from every side that are laws that exist but are not followed. And we're trying to find a safe haven to protect ourselves, but we're not being able to find them. Even the Freeland camp this year brought as a theme that our fight is still for our lives. It's not only a virus. We're not fighting the pandemic only. We have the pandemic, which is our federal government, our political scenario. And they want at every cost, not only to strip us of rights that we already have, but also strip us of our identity, of our way of life. So there's the virus of mining, there's the virus of uh, illegal exploitation, environmental, of the measures that are on the, that the federal government is bringing in. So we're always fighting against this lack of accountability in cities like Brumadinho and Mariana, where we had um, we had issues and the waters are still contaminated after the tailing dams bursted. So now we're having to check this bill that's on National Congress and they're trying to approve. And there's mining companies such as the Canadian mining company Bellosan and our companies such as Vale. And they're pressuring our government and our executive powers. They're trying to approve bills in the Congress to make mining legal. And this is very serious because we already know the consequences of this type of mining. We've been suffering attacks on our territories. We've been prosecuted, our leadership's prosecuted, so is persecuted, sorry. So if this is already happening right now with small groups of miners, imagine when large corporations start invading our territories. Everything that arrives our territory is a direct threat to the lives of our people, like diseases and invasion. We had recent attacks with machine guns to the Yanomani people. And this was not only a decision of the miners that were mining our land. This is also a, a demonstration from the federal government. They're inciting this invasion. So this fire that happened in the house of women Munduruku, of Munduruku women, this is also a way of trying to make us step down in our fight. They're trying to, they're trying to silence us. They're trying to make these bills pass on the executive of legislation of Brazil. So we're women who are trying to fight against this. The pandemic, unfortunately, makes it hard for us to get to the capital of Brazil in big numbers, but we're still fighting. We're trying to articulate with, together with 
international organizations, we're using the media, we're using alternative press, trying to bring visibility on all these attacks. The pandemic has already killed around 1,054 indigenous peoples, indigenous in Brazil. And this has been confirmed. And if we also consider all the people who have died as a consequence of COVID, this number is way larger. So 163 peoples have been contaminated, which is over half of the peoples in Brazil. So this is a very serious issue. The Amazon is the most affected region, and this is still very, very serious. People are talking about a third wave, but we're well, this is only a continuity because this pandemic hasn't gone away at any time. The vaccine has arrived, bringing some hope, but it hasn't arrived for everyone. And even though indigenous peoples are a priority group, at least 42% of the indigenous population is not being serviced by this federal government immunization program because a lot of us are not part or not living in the marked lands or living in human in urban sorry in urban areas or are not registered in the census so 42 percent around 42 percent of our indigenous population is being excluded excluded from this vaccination plan so we're here to talk about all these mining programs that are trying to destroy our environment and our lives. And we're going to fight this with our unity, with the force of our ancestrality. And all this force that's been with us with for 521 years. Thank you very much, Sonia. This is very inspiring. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I'd like to ask you to please tell us a bit more about this Bill 191. What are the powers that are trying to approve this bill? And what's the impact that's going to have on the communities connected to PIB and other indigenous communities? And how do the indigenous communities see this bill? One, like, one thing that I'd like to bring, bring forward is that indigenous people Indigenous peoples have their own organizations and own leaderships. And our effort is trying to support the initiatives coming from these organizations. So especially a PIB, which has been suspended due to the pandemic. And a PIB is the articulation of indigenous peoples of Brazil. And last March, we had an articulation with a PIB and other NGOs, popular movements. We were trying to be, bring these groups together so as to bring forward our fight against the president. And we even bought uh, plane tickets, but then right after that, the pandemic happened and all this has been suspended. So these attacks and attacks to the Munduruku villages and women and the Yanomani, this is something that our president has been saying throughout his whole campaign. He's been incentivizing mining throughout the Amazon. And in parallel, he's been also trying to assure that big projects, big mining projects, 
as Sonia said, projects that are of industrial scale, massive scale, Bolsonaro is trying to approve these projects. Currently, it's not legal to mine in demarked indigenous lands. And in the past few years, even before the current president, the fight for the fight from miners and from and from other industries that need that type of land is to try and avoid that new indigenous lands are demarked. So they're trying to use the geological diversity of the Amazon to bring in new investments. And as Sonia mentioned, we have Bello Sun, which is a mining company from Canada, and they're trying to mine in uh, one of the indigenous demarked lands called Xingu. We also had the Belo Monte industry. And during the Governo Bolsonaro and before it, we've been looking at the Amazon trying to extract our geological resources. So what's happening now is a more coordinated uh, approach. Bill 191 is not the only one that's that they are trying to approve. This is not the only project that's trying to approve uh, industrial mining in the Amazon. And this is the saddest part. So many of these investments that are coming with full force now, they had already been around before, even in previous governments. So this attack is not new. In our democratic period uh, post-dictatorship, we've had many projects, many bills that they're trying to approve to so we can have mining in indigenous lands. What's making these projects uh, not go forward that fast is international pressure, pressure. And people like Sonia, who've been speaking and trying to make noise about what's going on. So we have the situation now. The industrial scale mining uh, is on hold, but small scale mining is going on at full force. And it's not what you think with people trying to find gold nuggets uh, by the river. We're talking about huge machines and heavy metals causing massive destruction, which is also irreversible. Thank you very much, Maria Julia. Sonia, can you please compliment on a PIB's perspective on this? We're totally against this bill. And we want to stop it. Before we had project or bill 1610, which was which they were trying to approve for a while. Bill 111 was brought forward by the government themselves. They're trying to regulate the exploitation of mineral, hydric, and organic resources in landmarked, sorry, in marked indigenous territories in Brazil. So this initiative is from the federal government and they're trying to bring forward what our president Bolsonaro 
has been defending for a long time because they want to leverage uh, indigenous territories economically. So we have mining and we also have agribusiness. They've been trying to approve the use of land. And one of Bolsonaro's trips to our state of Roraima, he said there's three trillion reales in our lands and that the indigenous peoples have the right to exploit this because they should not remain, keep on being poor on top of very rich lands. And what they think is that all they think about is profits. They want to profit on exploiting the land. What they value is what they're going to get out of it in terms of money. They don't care how they're going to affect our identities or the environment because they don't really care about the future. They don't care that this is going to bring irreversible issues for future generations. So this bill brings forward specific conditions for exploiting gold and iron ore and hydrocarbonates, oil, natural gas, and also to leverage rivers for the use of hydroelectrical power plants. This bill encompasses every type of exploitation that they can. So for this, everything, they can do everything. They are trying to divide and conquer our indigenous populations. They're trying to get our support And today we had good news. There's 27 requests for mining on the Anglo-American. And we've been trying to, we've been trying to take out these requirements because all of these mining requests are within the marked indigenous lands. And today we got this information from the Anglo-American Association that these 27 requests have been reviewed. And they are now withdrawing these requests, which is great news for us. This is being now formalized. And out of these 27 requests, 13 were um, requests to exploit the Munduruku lands. And this is great news to us. Now we can try to take the federal police back there to take the invaders and the miners out of our land. So our fight now in the Munduruku territories from our leaderships is to try and pressure and have the federal police back in our land so they can complete their operation. And since the Ministry of Defense did not assure the logistics needed for federal police to stay in our territory, we are sure that this was, um, this was orchestrated by the executive powers because President Bolsonaro defends invas invaders, he defends miners. They defend all these miners and agribusinesses. So due to this, we have these daily fights and we try to do this uh, on the courts or on on the lands everywhere 
So when we're doing this, we're persecuted and even killed, unfortunately. We had data from violence on the field in 2020, and we had 18 murderers. Out of them, seven were indigenous people. So this is a very tense moment. We keep fighting to try and protect our way of life and our territories. Thank you very much, Sonia. This is really great news that Anglo-America, this association is trying to take away these mining requests in indigenous lands. And the last questions I have is, what are, the, what are the main impacts of mining to the people's health and security in the communities that are near the mines? I'm here right now from the state of Minas Gerais. I'm from here. I live in a city called Ouro Preto, which is very near a city called Mariana, where the Oh, one of the greatest tailing dam bursts happened. This was not the first ever, but was definitely the greatest. We had a deep environmental impact. And it's also the same state where the city of Brumadinho is placed, uh, where another tailing dam bursted in 2019. And there's, uh, and we had like hundreds of people affected 273 people died. In the past few weeks, we've had around 2,000 people die every day in Brazil. And quote, this has improved because a, a month ago, around 4,000 people were dying every day. And this was news that were all over the world. And this is the most public view on mining in Brazil, what we had in Mariana when the tailing dam burst. Because a lot of people uh, found out about mining in Brazil and its impact when they saw the images of Mariana and how the and how the mud destroyed the cities around it. And when they saw that mud getting to the sea and flowing through the river all the way to the sea. And this destruction that was caused in seconds from these two bursts on the tailing dams is insane. In Minas Gerais, we had over 2000 people taken away from their homes even family members of mine because of the impact of mining. We had the tailing dam burst that caused this massive impact, but we also have the everyday impacts. For instance, risks of um, blows and the, and the dust and the contamination of water and the noise We have contamination of uh, the water that's in the rivers or under the earth. A large iron ore mining dries all the water sources around it on a radius of six kilometers. And what Sonia brought up is something that I've been seeing in my state for a long time. When they announce that mining is coming, they say it's progress, it's going to bring wealth and bring uh, job opportunities. So they announce it as something great. And I'm saying this from a region that's been mining for almost 300 years. But what I see here is there's no possibility of agriculture in our state because there's no clear water, clean water for us. 
so it affects mining affects the way a lot of people live for instance farmers and people who depend on the land because there's no possible conciliation there's no way that people who live in indigenous lands or other types of protected land to have a good relationship with mining what also comes with mining is violence and the impact in violence is of violence is not the same for everyone it's worse for women and this is something we've been trying to to bring attention to in mom for instance which is the movement for popular sovereignty mining In the fight of the Munduruku people, there's no way we don't think of women. We have letters of people, and these letters come in and they they bring testimonials of what's going on. So there's no way that we don't think that most people who are trying to take a stance on this issue are women. And women are the ones who are exposed to most of this violence and violence, including domestic violence, including rape. Mining is an industry with temporary contracts with, with odd jobs and men who work in mining in Brazil, unfortunately, are very harsh men, they're more Rude. And unfortunately, they discount this on their women and on their children, their daughters. Another thing that affects people is the dirt. So there's more dust in, in people's clothes, in people's houses. And the weight of taking care of people who are ill also goes on to women. So there's uh, this mountainous region in Minas Gerais called Serra do Espinhaço, and it's been destroyed by mining. And I don't know one woman who's involved in these uh, fight against mining who has not suffered a type of violence because they're out there trying to speak out, they're trying to do something against it. And every day we're having to help a woman or uh, bring her from A to B to protect her from their companion. We're trying to protect them. And who are these women? They're indigenous, uh, they're African Brazilian, they're trying to come forward, they're journalists. And we have many of these women here now, and I want to uh, bring forward Judith Marshall, and I like to thank her a lot. She's been helping us, especially at the beginning of MAM. She's trying to bring to us the understanding of what it is to be a woman in this fight against mining. And this fight against mining in Brazil has, a, has the face of a woman. So I'm asking Fabricio to, to put up a, a video of a fight from 2016 from when women from the landless peoples of Brazil and MAM occupied a dam that ended up bursting in 2015. And it was the first time in that region that's been suffering from mining for a long time that we had a direct fight, a direct conflict. It was the first time in the history of that region in which we had a fight. And this fight was started by women. And I'd like to thank everyone here and thank Sonia saying that it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank Fabricio, thank Gabriela, and thank Rachel as well. Thank you very much for this moment that we're having here. And I'll end by showing you this video. Vida de alguém, quando vale a vida vale, quando 
women fighting Era. against the mud that's violent Eu... and kills. Era uma mãe. Quando a Lana chegou, I was a mother. O meu menino que tava aqui agarrado When the mud arrived, my boy who was here with me, foi he, he was four years old. And he was buried. And as if it wasn't enough, the one that I had with me is now blood and mud. He's now blood and mud. How much does the life of a person mean? How much is a person worth? Landless women organized. They transform the hate and all this disgrace involved in this, in this battle into a fight. Here we are with a lot of mixed feelings. We have feelings of revelness, of hate. We're here, trying, we're here wanting to cry and we're here sad. But especially, we're here today to say that the southeastern region of Brazil is showing the greatness of what women has been trying, have been trying to, to do. It's only possible to build a new life if we fight the capital. We can only redistribute re land if we fight a company like the mining, the miner Valley. We can only build a life of equality between men and women if we fight the capital directly. When we transgress the order, the future becomes breathable. When we transgress the order, the future becomes breathable. It's a very impacting video. Thank you very much, Maria Julia, for bringing it forward. When we transgress the order, the future becomes breathable. Sonia, would like would you like to add the perspective of the indigenous people on the impacts of mining on your health and safety? I think this video is a very clear picture of all the consequences of mining and what it causes to our lives. It leaves a trace of destruction behind. And I'd like to remind everyone that these audio files from the miners that have been going around in the month of April, they're trying to organize a mobilization in the capital of Brazil, Brasilia. And these audio file, files uh, reveal how much they are trying to invest in keeping exploring the land. April, which is a month that's always been considered by us as the month of indigenous peoples and resistant, resistance and the free land camp, this month, they tried to hack the this month of April. So these audio files have been going around and people are trying to raffle and to have auctions to see who gives more money so they can get money to get indigenous peoples to the capital of Brazil. And these people who were they who they were calling allies, they were trying to bring uh, in front of the Supreme Court of Brazil so they could so they could be in favor of the bills 
that are pro-mining and against indigenous populations. So miners were trying to bring some indigenous to Brazil, who they were called the lies, to get the government to rush their approval on mining projects. And on these audio files that they're trying to gather money for, for this, they were saying, come to mining, there's, there's room for everyone. Women can be cooks, women can wash her clothes. And there's other types of services in case they're single. So it's, it's really open. It's insane the way in which they try and exploit women. Women go there to be abused, exploited. And they even, they even do public advertising to try and lure people into this. So I'd like to bring forward these audio files to reinstate how much mining is, um, is bad, is evil for the land and for people. On top of all the land and river contamination, all the diseases that brings that it brings into the indigenous lands, it also leaves this trace of destruction that's totally irreversible. So we have to be against this distorted progress logic that they have, which is this progress that's based on destruction, that's based on death, which is what mining leaves behind, this trace of destruction and death. Thank you very much, Sonia. Before we move forward to the audience's questions, I'd like to bring in Devin Holterman, the communications and fundraising coordinator at the Canadian Network on Corporate Accountability. Devin holds a PhD in human geography from York University, and he has long been involved in social justice and environmental activism in Canada and around the globe. Today, Devin is going to bring us the proposal of the Canadian Network of Corporate Responsibility. So thank you very much, Devin. You now have the floor. Thank you so much for organizing this uh, very important event this evening and for inviting me to participate. Uh, I am very honored to be with you all tonight, and I have certainly learned a lot uh, already this evening. As Fabricio said, my name is Devin Holterman, and I work with the Canadian Network on Corporate Accountability, or the CNCA. And today I'll very briefly be speaking about some of our network's efforts in working to ensure that Canadian companies operating overseas are held accountable. For those that don't know, the CNCA is the national coordination body for civil society groups and labor unions advancing business and human rights in Canada. The, orga the organization was formed in 2005 and the CNCA unites 39 environmental and human rights NGOs, religious organizations, labor unions, and solidarity groups, including Kairos. So together we call for Canadian law and policy reform to ensure that communities impacted by Canadian companies overseas can access remedy in Canada, Canadian companies respect human rights in their global operations, and if companies are involved in overseas abuses, they face real consequences in Canada. I will start today by simply stating that it is long known that some Canadian companies are implicated in human rights abuses and environmental damage uh, around the globe. And despite knowing about the seriousness of corporate abuse for many decades, Canada has failed to establish rules that require Canadian companies respect human rights and the environment in their global operations and throughout their supply chains. Instead, Canada relies on what are generally referred to as voluntary mechanisms for business and human rights, 
Um, and these mechanisms we know after many decades um, do not work very well in protecting human rights and the environment. Corporate abuse is, of course, not a problem unique to Canada. Uh, so to ensure corporate accountability, several countries have enacted or are in the process of adopting laws that actually require companies to review all of their business activities and relationships, uh, identify actual and potential risks to people on the planet that stem from these activities and relationships, take steps to mitigate, mitigate and address these risks and to ensure remedy for those that are harmed by corporate activity. Uh, this is often referred to as human rights and environmental due diligence. Uh, and you'll see this term used in discussions um, in international corporate accountability discussions quite frequently. And so building on some of these international proposals, uh, that have been coming forward over the last number of years. The CNCA has worked with legal professionals, uh, subject experts, our membership and global partners to draft model legislation that provides a blueprint for lawmakers to write into Canadian law, the corporate respect for human rights and the environment. And actually earlier today, we released this draft model legislation uh, that will be guiding our network's campaigning efforts into the, the near future. And so if adopted, this, the CNCA's uh, legal proposal would require Canadian companies to prevent human rights and environmental harm throughout their global operations and supply chains. Under this model legislation, if a company causes harm or fails to do its due diligence, it could be subject to legal action in Canada. In my remaining few moments, I don't want to take too much time uh, this evening. I will discuss uh, three core elements of the CNCA's proposed law. So first, in this proposed uh, model legislation, the law actually establishes a duty on Canadian companies to prevent human rights and environmental harm. So if this law was adopted, companies would have to take steps to ensure that they are respecting human rights and the environment throughout their operations and supply chains. Secondly, the model law, again, if adopted, would require companies to conduct due diligence and publicly report on the steps taken to prevent human rights and environmental harms. So companies would have to consult with rights holders identify risks and stop contributing to harm throughout their operations and their supply chains. And finally, this model law, it also includes significant consequences for companies that cause harm and or fail to conduct their due diligence. Communities and workers who suffer would have access to remedy and would have the statutory right to sue companies in Canadian courts. If a company does not develop, implement, and or report on its due diligence, it could also face legal action if this uh, model legislation was adopted by Canada. So I will just finish by saying that our network will be actively campaigning for this law to be enacted in Canada in the coming months and years. And we are calling on Canada to catch up to global leaders in Europe and other countries who have adopted similar laws and ensure that Canadian companies respect human rights and the environment, and that those harmed have access to remedy. Uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Muito obrigado, David. É realmente uma proposta de legislação que é, parece ser muito promissora em termos de é, Thank you very much, Devin. This is a very interesting law. This will be interesting to society and to everyone involved, having these companies being held responsible for their actions, especially the mining companies and all the companies that violate human rights. We have two questions. So we can finish. First of all is how do you, Maria Julia and Sonia, think that we could 
build more solidarity uh, ties between Canadian and Brazilian organizations and how we in Canada can we contribute to the fight for land and water in Brazil. And the second question is the behavior of mining company, companies during the pandemic. How would you characterize the presence of these mining companies in indigenous communities since the pandemic started? So starting with the last question, so on Viviana's question at the beginning of the pandemic there was a decree from the president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, classifying uh, several economic activities as being essential. So on this decree of March 2020, he said that mining was an essential activity. So this was good for the mining companies because this protected them, them judicially. This helped them to continue operating and to continue licensing the environmental projects. So we have several levels of environmental licensing. And these projects have a few steps. And now they're, the, the government's being able to bring down these several steps and trying to simplify everything into one single bill that's now passed to the Senate. The licensing on, in all levels have kept on happening last year. So if you have um, a small scale mining, for instance, a query or something like that, it's been licensed, it's been approved in a one to hour online audience. And just a reminder, most communities don't even have access to the internet. So sometimes they have mobile data or, but they don't really have Wi-Fi or optic fiber. And there were also large scale projects in which this continued to happen. So we're now in 2021 and we had a lot of approvals in the world of mining, especially in iron ore and bauxite. So we have the possibility in the short term to have a massive increase in conflicts related to mining because we keep on approving new minings and the ones that already existed, existed also keep on happening. So we have a map that we did for two regions, two states, Minas Gerais and Pará. We have the mine of Carajás, which is the biggest iron ore map mine in the world. And you can see on the map, the map shows uh, the level of contamination on the land and it skyrockets near the mine. So we have a lot of deaths related to it. And in the neighboring cities or the neighboring communities, you see that the death rate goes down a bit compared to where the mine is. The biggest project of Anglo-America outside of Africa is also uh, located on my state, which is Minas Gerais. And you can see the increase which is on the, the temps compared to 
the municipalities around it, which live on farming and agriculture. So the death rate near these massive mining projects is way higher than the ones around it. So if we can get more support, it would be great because the indigenous peoples of Brazil are under attack. We need more letters and more and more testimonials and we need them translated and we need them the word spread because this helps the pressure this work is very important translating uh, the files and the books we have this website which is a repository for materials and if we can have the support from this network of translators this would be great and because we have many miners in Brazil, and especially Canadian miners, this helps us have, uh, it helps us to have more information on them. The biggest tailing dam in the state of Minas Gerais is from a Canadian company. It's in the state of Minas Gerais, but it's two hours away from our capital, Brasilia. And sometimes it's hard to realize the, the path that money follows. So this information is very important. And we and we also have some urgency in the project involving the mining company from Canada called Bellosan. We we can't have it installed in the Shingu indigenous land. And I'd like to thank Kairos for inviting us. Sonia, please. I'd like to add something. I'd like to add something about the levels of mercury contamination, uh, especially in the Yanomani and Munduruku lands. At some point in the Munduruku lands, we had 70% of our people contaminated by mercury. We also had a person who was working uh, trying to defend the indigenous lands and they died because of mercury contamination. At the Yanomani land, at some point, we had 90% of our children contaminated by mercury. So this is the result of mining near our lands. What we can do is this, promote events, have these discussions, put pressure on these mining companies. PIB have been doing these campaigns against Anglo and against Black Oak, which is one of the greatest investors on these companies. And in 2019, we had this informative com uh, campaign in Europe, and we talked to people up in the parliament, we talked to the society, so we could create these national laws in each country. What we want is to track these products. We want to track gold. We want to see the path that the gold takes. And by tracking the gold, we're trying to bring sanctions to the companies that are involved in this and are, are not following human rights and environmental rights. And what we ask on the part of society is to keep pressuring the, their governments and their companies. So this international support is very important because it brings visibility on what's going on. We should also 
pressure the companies on their companies to try and create these laws. So the companies have control and take and, and are held accountable on what they're exploiting and commercializing. We need products to arrive at their destination in a clean way. We don't want them tarnished in blood. Thank everyone. Thank you everyone for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Maria, Julia, and Sonia for your particip participation. I know you've done a great effort to be here with us tonight. We know, especially now with all this demand, your schedules are probably full. And before we finish, I'd like to reinforce the invitation to all those who have not yet accessed. I'm sorry, guys, I muted myself by accident, so I'd like to start again. Thank you very much, Maria, Julia, and Sonia. I know you've I know you have very busy schedule, so thank you for being here tonight. And before we finish, I'd like to invite you again for you to access the Mir Hub. I've added the link to our chat. We have the link in both English, Portuguese, and English and, and Spanish. We have a wide range of materials on mining, including maps, podcasts, videos, documents. It's a lot of resources that's going to help in our defense of water and land. So now uh, I'll have Rachel speak. Thank you very much. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank, thank you for that. And it's, my, um, it's my pleasure to give the, the final thank yous. I think um, what we've heard this afternoon um, about the environmental, the human rights, the, the gendered um, health impacts of, of, of mining in Brazil, about how COVID has exacerbated that, about all the um, other oh, pandemics. Uh, that um, that have been identified uh, the the pandemic of, uh, of of mining of resource extraction of of, of lack of accountability of uh, gender uh, gender violence I think all of these uh, are real strong evidence uh, for the need for um, the mayor hub a Brazil um, and Portuguese focused uh, mayor hub. Uh, as well as um, the mandatory, mandatory human rights due, 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 due diligence uh, and, and, and the work of the CNCA. Um, so I'm, again, I really um, encourage you to, to visit the Mayor Hub as, as Fabrizio was, um, was uh, outlining. And I, I also encourage you to follow the campaign of, of CNCA. I believe next week uh, there is actually a training if you want to become a corporate um, accountability advocate. Um, and I finally, I want to thank you. I want to thank Sonia and Mary Julia for your, for your, for your interventions, uh, for your, all your work uh, in defense of land and water and life, uh, for your courage and tenacity and strength, um, for being um, that face of the struggle, um, the woman's face of the struggle. I want to thank you. Um, you're an inspiration. Um, and Fabrizio, I want to thank you for moderating uh, and, and coordinating this event, helping to coordinate this event. And thank you for um, initiating and catalyzing and, and bringing, bringing into existence the, uh, the Mayor Hub Brazil. Uh, thank you for making it happen. Um, I want to thank uh, Rebecca for your fabulous translation. Um, I don't know if you want to put your camera on just so people can can see see you, but but thank you for making this um, this communication possible and for for allowing us to share this this information uh, with with each other. 
Um, thank you, Devin, uh, for your such a clear uh, presentation of uh, CNCA's work and your campaign. Um, thank you, Gabriella, uh, for making this possible, for being behind the scenes, for doing all the tech, um, uh, but also for the Mayor Hub. I have to tell you that the Mayor Hub um, was, it was for years, it, it, it had been something that uh, women land defenders particularly have been calling for for years. Um, and uh, Gabriella has made it happen in a very uh, profound and beautiful way. So thank you, Gabriella, for that. Um, uh, and um, yeah, that's then thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you for, for joining us. Please, um, please, uh, yeah, check out the, the Mayor Hub and, and please continue to, to, to follow to follow our work uh, and, and the work of these um, amazing, amazing women. Um, so thank you and have a good evening. Ciao. Ciao. Gracias. See you. <laughs>